Welcome to Business Reporter's Risk Management Campaign. I'm Alastair Greener. A few months ago, the stocks of non-performing loans, otherwise known as NPLs, were the lowest since the financial crisis of 2008. This piece of good news is history compared to today. The economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will result in the surge of NPLs, and creditors must prepare for a swift and efficient response. Can technology help? Well, lenders have always tried to understand the risks and the opportunities that come with each client. FinTech experts claim that smart algorithms can help them in their risk analysis. Are the European banks and policymakers ready for the implementation of fresh solutions? Will the current economic recession trigger faster answers? What does reliable technology look like? Well, these are the questions we're going to be putting to Terry Franklin from Quelco. Good morning. Good morning, Alistair. What are the expectations for NPLs after the pandemic? Are there any forecasts out there? The level of NPLs is going to increase as a consequence of the pandemic. Quantifying the levels to which they'll uh, increase is very difficult at the moment because there are so many unknowns. In different countries, you've got moratorium, uh, you have furlough schemes, um, payment holidays have been offered in terms of specific um, financial packages, so for mortgages, loans, etc. So the real issue is who is actually going to be impacted the most as we start to unwind from the pandemic. We know that there's been a, a number of support schemes that as they start to come to an end, people in different industries are going to suddenly find that their financial circumstances are worsening. We're already starting to see the, the unemployment levels increase and I think overall there is going to be a lot of downward pressure economically um, and therefore we're going to see those NPL levels go up. Now, although obviously COVID-19 has had a major impact on this, the reality is there were fluctuations in the market before the pandemic even happened. So what are the most recent and the most major trends that are happening? So fundamentally, nobody really understands how severely the impact is going to be um, as a consequence of the pandemic. And the real trick is understanding how individual groups of customers are likely to be impacted and whether they're going to be more adversely impacted than they have historically. So everything we, we knew in the past no longer becomes relevant in the future because different sectors are going to be more uh, affected than other sectors. So the ability to spot that and do something about that is going to be a big differentiator for organisations. Now, the NPL level is, is one thing, but the other thing is the changing, as, as you implied there, the changing customer behaviour. So how do financial institutions adapt to that changing environment? Identifying the connections between the data associated with the customers and the subpopulations within a portfolio and establishing quite quickly who is more adversely impacted becomes a real value driver. And the reason for that is if you know that a, a certain group of customers, maybe in a different sector, are showing greater signs of financial stress, then you can start to interact with them very differently. You can be proactive in the way that you approach those customers and you can preempt some of the challenges that you know are going to create demand down the line. However, how easy is it for financial institutions to really get that data really, really quickly and respond in an agile way to establish those patterns and the variety that they really need to be effective? So we're working with a number of organisations to do just that, to establish those changes in behaviour by implementing solutions that are, are quick and easy to drive benefit. And the key thing here is to consume that data, typically in a daily snapshot, in order to see how things change from one day to the next. The ability to consume that data and apply analytics to it, to, to draw out the differential activities that customers are, are showing as a consequence of um, the pandemic. So people coming in and asking for more help as they come out of furlough, for example, they start to, to raise um, concerns with their lenders. Spotting those trends and then changing how you interact with the customer becomes really important. We're doing that in a matter of weeks with organisations, putting those solutions in, starting to consume that data and then quickly looking for the trends within that data. Now, historically, building a scorecard could take a number of weeks and even months. Um, what we're trying to do here is to accelerate that process where it's appropriate to do so in order to get those sort of benefits. 
you say this data can be used to identify these differences. The problem is we know that data is king. We know it's available. We know it's out there. And tech companies will say that they will use that data, give you the analytics really, really quickly. Yet we're still seeing financial institutions and banks still have the same old problems. Why is that? So I think there are a number of things in, in banking organisations. Um, there's certainly a will to, to, to apply those uh, intelligent insights in terms of differentiating the way they interact with customers. There's a whole raft of regulation. Um, there's often legacy systems. But also there needs to be a, a commitment, a wherewithal, um, to make sure that you can take that intelligent insight and use it to drive differentiated interactions with customers. If you look at a, a banker, for example, a traditional banker that's been around for years, they've always had this mentality of being able to help the customer. And there's a perception that I can help the customer because I need to interject and understand their circumstances and almost an avoidance of believing that technology can do that for them. So I think it, it's a little bit of a mindset in some instances. Um, but if you do take on board that the intelligence will identify and drive better actions, then you can actually provide the customer with a better set of solutions to their circumstances. Tell us about what you do at Quelco and how you deal with these challenges that we've been talking about. So we've done a lot of work in terms of integrating our decision engine with our collection solution. Um, we take hundreds of characteristics from the collection solution and we feed them into our decision engine. And we use that to establish very quickly based on day-to-day -day snapshots of how customer behavior is changing. So if you see that the demand starts to go up in a particular segment or sub-segment, that you can quickly spot that and then you can change operationally how you interact with those groups of customers. And as I mentioned, you, you can start to then apply a proactive um, set of actions in order to minimize the impacts. Now, your clients are going to want tangible results. So how do you go about measuring success? So fundamentally here, it's about developing true champion challenger scenarios looking at the current processes and the performance in those current processes, consuming that data, applying your analytics to that data, and then making the recommendations uh, to the business in order to differentiate how they treat the customer. But that, that's treated as separate challenger population. So you monitor the outcomes as a consequence of implementing that challenger scenario. And very quickly, you can build up the, the, the benefits arguments. There are a number of other efficiencies around accelerated cash flow and, and being able to better manage bad debt, for example. And to be able to achieve that, you're obviously implying there's going to be quite a bit of change. And the one thing we know about change is it causes disruption. So in reality, how much disruption can we expect if we started to work with Quelco? We fully accept that. But we also understand that if, if we're very clear with the client of how our solutions interact with their existing infrastructure, we can very quickly get to an approach that allows them to take advantage, not only in terms of putting in a minimum viable solution to get them started, but also to have a minimum viable solution that's expandable and, and can really take them forward from that point. When it comes to NPLs, how vigilant do you think financial institutions are going to have to be over the coming years? There hasn't been a time in my life where it's more important than it is now to understand very quickly how all of the scenarios being driven by the pandemic are going to affect individual customers. So for example, we're seeing sectors that have never necessarily been adversely impacted in an economic downturn before. We're seeing customers who've always had a very good payment behavior suddenly finding that they're in uh, distressed positions, spotting those customers, interacting with them in an effective way helping them manage that circumstance so that they can get back onto their feet as quickly as possible. And that's crucial for all organisations is to be able to, to do that, to spot those circumstances and to interact with those customers in the most effective way possible. Well, we know that we're in an unprecedented time of change and uncertainty. So it's been really interesting when it comes to NPLs to get some gauge, some idea of where we are at the moment, but more importantly, what we can expect in the future. Terry Franklin from Quelco, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alistair.